Again, thank you to our string quartet. We have truly enjoyed your music this morning. So let me start with an understatement. Almost everything in 2020 has just been a mess. We will be glad when this year is over. I know a couple who got engaged about this time last year. They have been planning a spectacular wedding for a whole year. Early in 2020, they imagined several hundred guests coming together at their church for their nuptials early in December, and then a magical walk for a few blocks to a golden ballroom where the guests would gather for a fancy dinner and toasting and dancing. That was before COVID. Fast forward to, a, well, four location changes, many downsizing of guests, people calling to cancel, the wedding party bowing out one by one, by two, by four, family members worried about attending, even wedding party canceling, and then their planned honeymoon def indefinitely on hold because Hawaii isn't allowing visitors in. Each day, every day, another chip away at their plan. More disappointing phone calls and cancellations. And then a month ago, they canceled the idea of a reception altogether. It's too dangerous for people to eat together, even socially distanced. Then the church, well, the city, canceled the option of having a wedding of more than 50 inside the building. No room for them in the... They scrambled for another venue. Can you even imagine the stress of seeking a new venue just a couple of weeks before a wedding and all the changes that would ensue, notifying guests, hotel reservations in a different part of the city, notifying vendors, everything changing from photographer to hairdresser to decorations, all the things that change from one venue to the next. And now a week to go and they're getting married in an open air horse arena with wood chips on the floor with guests spaced out across the open air arena, dressed probably in winter coats and maybe ski pants because the weather is predicted to be somewhere around 55 degrees inside during the day, colder if it's in the evening. They don't know what time the wedding will be, although it's six days away. And then they'll go outside for a champagne toast with masks that have holes inside just big enough for a straw to fit through and borrowed fire barrels outside. When we Zoomed this week to finalize the latest plans, the groom told me that the process of months of daily disappointments has been a daunting challenge but that it has cemented their relationship. After all they have been through, he said that they are more determined than ever to be married and that they are delighted that they still get to be married, even in a horse arena. It's not at all what they had imagined, but this is what he said in essence. While we're disappointed, that our dream wedding is not going to happen the way we imagined. What we really wanted was to get married with the people we love around us. And that will still happen. Many of the people we love will join us virtually, 
but we're still getting married and we love each other. And all the rest is icing on the cake. It occurs to me that they have been stripped down to the bare minimum. And yet they found the true meaning in the day. And if I'm honest, listening to them talk was a good lesson for this old, married, cynical minister to take to heart. I assured them that I have it on good authority that it's not the first time God will show up in a stable around this time of year to bless a new family. But if I'm honest, they gave me a few lessons. Their love amid such distress and anxiety and loss, well, it reminded me that love triumphs over everything else in the end. Our traditional word for today is from Luke 2, verses 1 to 7. I'd invite you to listen to these ancient words with new ears, as if you were listening to them as a friend, perhaps, of this couple and worried about them on their journey to Bethlehem. It's not the word printed in your bulletin, but rather from Luke 2. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world would be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. As I was preparing for this sermon on hope, I kept spinning my wheels. And the reason was, I was thinking all week, how do we have hope when the pandemic numbers are startlingly high? And let's not kid ourselves, those numbers represent real humans. They not only, re in, they not only reflect infected people, but the risk people have of getting sick they also reflect people who are in hospitals. And our doctors at Wesley Hospital told us this week, one in 10 of the people in the hospital will die from COVID. They reflect real people in our community. How do we talk about hope when many of us celebrated Thanksgiving without our loved ones who would normally be with us? And we're wondering, will Christmas look the same? How do we celebrate hope when we're wondering if the transition of power in our democratic, usually peaceful nation will be smooth in the White House or in our streets? How do we celebrate hope when more and more people need help because of unemployment, long-term poverty, mental health, or illness? How do we celebrate hope when the pandemic has infected and affected domestic violence, alcohol consumption, drug abuse, and other violent behaviors? How do we celebrate hope when the effects of children being out of the classroom and learning online is yet to be determined, but the probability is that our educational system will be light years behind where it should be. We're feeling anxious, really anxious. 
like that bride and groom, like Joseph and Mary, like life is hitting us with one thing and then another and then another. Every day, anxiety heightens. And then it's Advent. But Advent, it's a time of darkness a time in which we hunger for the light. It, it's in the darkest of nights that we yearn for our God. You know, sometimes people mistake this time coming into December as the time of Christmas. But in the church, December is about Advent, not Christmas. Advent is the four weeks before Christmas that we prepare. And Christmas is a totally different time than Advent. Christmas is a time of bright bulbs and glee and glitter and glimmer. Jesus comes at Christmas. Christmas is the time when we put our grief to bed. But the church gets to Christmas by waiting through the period of the Advent. Isaiah reminds us that we are a people who walk in darkness. Darkness, we know, is paralyzing and disorienting. Christians recognize this darkness as a dominant metaphor for life without God and therefore without hope. That's where our season of Advent begins. Do you know where we are without God? It's difficult to imagine. Our world, a conflicting geographic space of good and evil and the mundane, it can show us where we would be without God. Think about the moments where God has been far away in your life. Think about that. Advent is the time when we join in a history of longing for the full arrival of God to this planet. We desperately want and need a light in our dark world. And yet, and there's always a yet in our gospel, we come to Advent knowing the end, knowing the full assurance with our gospel that the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in the land of deep darkness, on them have a light shone. You know, whenever the disciples were stressed and it felt like the world was falling apart, Jesus counseled them for several things. He said, stay alert, be present, pray, and trust God. Those are good instructions for Advent when we're walking in the darkness. Stay alert, be present, pray, and trust God. They sound easy easy until we have to put them into practice when we're walking in the dark and we're anxious. We would prefer some immediate resolution. Stay alert, be present, pray, trust God. But in a pandemic, they seem inadequate, woefully inactive. That's our call during Advent, during the time we're waiting in the dark, waiting and trusting. I don't know if you had nightmares when you were a child. I did. My nightmares were terrifying. As a, an adult, looking back, they seem pretty ridiculous. But at the time, they were so very real. There were bigger than life monsters under my bed and in my closet. I was so convinced that they were there. 
I could not open my mouth to scream for help and I could not get out of bed because they would eat my ankles. I laid there wide awake in the dark with my heart pounding and literal sweat covered my body. I was afraid to move, too scared to scream, but eventually, knowing that I regularly had these fears, my mom would come to check on me, and she literally talked and walked me through my fears. She would turn on the lights, look under my bed to assure me, and open my closet door. I thought she was so brave to go first. And she would take me by the hand after she looked and show me that there were no monsters. I hung back in fear and trembling. I trusted her, but I was still afraid, even with the lights on. Stay awake, be present, pray. Trust God. Advent is a time of waiting. It's a time of hope. But listen, friends, hope is not the same thing as optimism. Hope is rooted in trusting God. Hope is deeper and it's more sound than optimism. It's based in our belief and our trust in a higher power. We don't just walk in darkness. We believe that the light of Christ will come and shine in our darkness. It's more than optimism. It's faith. One of the tragedies of this pandemic is that we have locked ourselves away from one another. We have had to do this to be safe. But the side effect has had devastating results because for many of us, we have walked in darkness too long. So I invite you this week to take time, if you can, to Zoom with a couple in love or a child, or someone who will bring light and love into your life, or someone who makes you laugh, perhaps a college roommate, or a friend across the country you haven't talked to. Find some hope in the darkness any way you can. If you don't Zoom, do something else that's simple. Read the story about the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Read it every day if you can. It's actually a little bit funny if you look at it through new eyes. The idea of it, the child, God, being born in a stable. Ridiculous. Silly. It's like, it's like a ridiculous couple planning a wedding for a year and then ending up in a horse arena during a pandemic and being happy about it because they're in love. Amen.